uh, flew over the boats, uh, let commandos down from them. Uh, Where did the helicopters come from? Well, from your pockets, if you're, pay if you're taxpayers. Israel doesn't manufacture helicopters. We give them the helicopters with the purpose of carrying out war crimes. And that's not a joke. Uh, in, just to give one example, in the first month of the, in September uh, 2000, uh, just about the time that Israel withdrew from Lebanon finally, in September 2000, the, uh, the second intifada broke out. The first month of it was September. It was right after Ariel Sharon had uh, uh, gone on that famous uh, visit to the uh, uh, region of the Temple Mount. Uh, very provocative. And then the next day, uh, Ehud Barak sent a big military force, which killed a lot of people. Uh, then it broke out. Uh, in that first month, September, there were uh, 70 Palestinians killed and uh, four Israeli soldiers, uh, the, the usual ratio. Uh, if you go back to the press reports, you'll find that uh, the, uh, Israel, Israel was using helicopters, meaning American helicopters, uh, to attack uh, uh, civilian targets like apartment complexes killing dozens of people. It was reported. Uh, what was not reported, however, and to this day is barely known, is that just as those reports were coming out about U.S. helicopters being used to attack civilian complexes, uh, Bill Clinton uh, made, sent, made a deal to send the biggest uh, consignment of helicopters to Israel ever. Or, or at least in a decade, uh, Black Hawk helico helicopters and uh, spare parts for Apache helicopters, the attack helicopters. That came out right at the time that uh, the news reports were coming out about using them to attack civilian complexes. It wasn't a secret. You could read it in the Israeli press, you could read it in uh, the military journals, James Defense Weekly, you could read it in the European press. Uh, Amnesty International had a report about it, condemning it. Not a word in the U.S. press. Actually, one word. One small newspaper in Virginia had a, a reference to it. Uh, it wasn't that it wasn't known. It was all over the wire services. So editors were, in fact, approached, asking them why, why you don't run it. Well, you know, that's uh, the kind of contribution that we make to these atrocities. Uh, and we'll continue to uh, Obama's one of the more extreme in this respect, as in the example I just mentioned. Well, if that comes, that's one major war that may come pretty soon, maybe is likely to come. It's not the only one. Uh, the one that's more likely, in fact, is imminent any day now, is an attack on uh, Kandahar in Afghanistan, second largest city in Afghanistan. It's been announced, it's not a secret, that the next major uh, attack in Afghanistan is going to be on Kandahar. Well, the U.S. Army has published, uh, taken polls and published them, so you can read them in the American press, of opinion in Kandahar. That's about 95% opposed to a military action, uh, uh, 19 to 1 by the tribal elders who've met uh, <coughs> Apart from poll, the same percentage say we don't want uh, military action against our Afghan brothers, referring to the Taliban. Okay, that's the next one that's coming. You can guess what that's going to look like. Uh, the last uh, attack, very widely reported and heralded as a great victory, was uh, an attack on Marja. Marja is a town, a small town <coughs> in the Helmand province where most of the uh, insurgency is in the Pashtun areas. Uh, and Marja was finally con conquered after a couple of days of pretty bitter fighting. Uh, as you may have seen, a few days after that, the, uh, the commander, I think a lieutenant general or something, forgot his name, uh, had an interview in the press in which he said, uh, we've got to revise our notion of enemy he said, we were thinking we were going to drive the enemy out of uh, Marja, but now we understand 
that the people of Marja support the enemy. So we can't, we've got to re recalibrate and think some other way of talking about who the enemy is. This is very reminiscent of uh, earlier uh, counterinsurgency wars. In fact, you could have read the same in Pravda in the 1980s. And you could have read the same in the United States in the 1960s, where it was written. Uh, so for example, in, uh, must have been 1965, the leading U.S. government scholar, uh, Douglas Pike, uh, wrote a book about the Viet Cong. The Viet Cong is a derogatory term invented by U.S. propaganda for the National Liberation Front, the Southern Resistance. Uh, and he uh, described how difficult the U.S. goals are going to be in uh, uh, South Vietnam. He said the problem we face is that uh, uh, the Viet Cong uh, are, ma are the only mass-based political force in South Vietnam. And to try to confront them, say, in, by political means, would be like a minnow confronting a whale, uh, our clients being the minnow, them being the whale. So therefore, the only thing we can do is to re reconstruct, reconstruct the war so that it's not the kind they want, a political war, but it's the kind we're good at a military war, so we prefer our comparative advantage, which is violence. And we have to do that because there's no other way to for a minnow to deal with a whale. And in fact, that's uh, the main principle of the famous uh, coin, as it's now called, counterinsurgency doctrine, which is you know, the wonderful new uh, uh, theory that we're supposed to be dedicated to. And yeah, if you're fighting wars in uh, other people's countries, you're constantly faced with that. It's not, it's not the United States that invented it, or the Russians, or the British could have told you the same thing, the French, uh, the Germans, in fact, as far back as you go, uh, the Romans, or, uh, the Greeks. Well, that's the prospect we're looking for at. And uh, for whatever years I have left, I don't expect them to be different from the past 75 uh, of consciousness, uh, uh, unless something very significant happens here, at least a willingness to face the reality of these uh, of these uh, actions. I'll stop there and turn to you. So if you would like to ask a question or say something, raise your hand and you'll get a microphone. Do you think that if Barack Obama is erected, um, uh, <laughs> elected for a second term, you will see him go more to the right? Go more to the right? Yes. It's hard to know. I'm going to take, say, George Bush. Uh, Bush's second term was considerably more centrist than his first term. First term was uh, you know, abrasive, aggressive, uh, uh, of brazen. I mean, he uh, basically, literally, he, he and Colin Powell and the rest uh, told Europeans, literally, you either do what we say or you're irrelevant. Uh, and uh, we don't care about you. We make history was one of their famous words. But we don't care. You, you guys, the reporters, you can report history, but we make it. Uh, and they went ahead and made it, uh, like in Iraq, for example. Uh, the, that uh, term dropped U.S. prestige to its lowest point in history. The U.S. became one of the most hated countries in the world and feared countries in the world. And it led to quite considerable internal criticism right within the establishment. Well, the second Bush term moved, was more moderate, moved more toward the center. They kicked out some of the most uh, outlandish figures, uh, Rumsfeld, uh, Wolfowitz, uh, a couple others. Couldn't get rid of Dick Cheney because he basically was the administration. But right. The others, they, a lot of the others went. And it was 